promoting promotion in um, an album. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that was actually um, a little bit of a side project. And it, it was uh, a friend of mine does visual effects and a lot of like shader work. And um, he reached out to me and one other friend of ours for another friend of his who was trying to release her first album. And he wanted to do some promotional work for it and also wanted to collaborate with us. Um, it's something we talked about for a while. Um, but the idea behind the project was to create kind of like a generative system or a, a system to allow for like a generative sort of reactive visual effects structure that follows music. So it's a lot of like reading in cues and sort of programmatically tracking what's happening in a piece of music and then using those cues and events to trigger actual like visual effects behaviors. Um, so the long and the short of it is we ended up with kind of like a almost generative music video um, to track some album art that we kind of rendered into 3D models and produced a bunch of like visual effects stuff over for like about a minute's worth of content. And uh, it was a really interesting workflow. And I think that was kind of the most fun part about it for me is coming up with like the tools to make this workflow possible to allow my friend Steve to um, kind of create whatever was in his head, but reactively to what was happening in the music instead of like doing it as a raw animation. That's um, great. Yeah. And uh, how did you get into gaming? <laughs> gaming or game design? Well, in the gaming industry in general. Okay. Um, so I actually have been, and this kind of touches on the wearing multiple hats thing, but I've been uh, doing like programming and I started doing computer science probably in like 2012, 2013. Um, I didn't do it too seriously for a while, but that was kind of my entry point. I, I knew that that was something I've, I was interested in going into. I've um, done a lot of kind of engineering-y things for like years and years and years. Um, but I've also just been super into video games since I was like six. Um, so I, I started doing, I started studying computer science and uh, took that, let's see, I did about two years of that in school and then I took a break from school and I wasn't really sure where I wanted to go with that, but I'd also, I've been playing music for like 20 years. Um, and I really enjoy kind of the audio side of things. I, I, I always enjoyed listening to like how spaces sounded and was like super curious about kind of where and how people got sounds and games to work the way they do and to sound the way they do. So a couple of years ago, I found a um, certification program through, excuse me, a local recording studio that there was, it was essentially like a crash course in all things game audio, just super basic fundamentals, um, but like really in depth. And I took that course and realized that like sound design is something I was super into. And then kind of coming out of that because of my programming experience, I was able to kind of mesh the two together to get to where I am. And that's where the multiple hats thing comes in. That's great. And this um, really does lead well into a question that a student has asked Aditi. Mm -hmm. um, she asks, um, or they ask, how were you able to narrow your studies and find your passion starting from this large umbrella of computer science down to sound design? Yeah. Uh, so part of it is just that I have a lot of background in music and um, I guess I just kind of picked a direction and tried it. And it, was, it wouldn't be the first direction I tried. I mean, programming was the first direction I tried and just raw programming. I found myself like really craving the kind of, I, I don't want to say creative, more like, but like the traditionally artistic sort of 
hands-on in the weeds approach um, and workflow. Because I definitely think that programming is a hyper creative outlet. Um, but I, I, I was really craving that kind of like artistic expression. Um, and once I found sound design, which again, I kind of just stumbled into because of my previous inclinations mm -hmm. and realized that it was something I enjoyed. I think I, I went too far <laughs> into that for a little while and realized that now I was kind of missing the programming side of things. Um, and fortunately for me, indie games exist and technical audio is a thing. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. And so that kind of let me find what I really kind of consider to be my niche, um, which is that, that bridge between pure audio and programming, which is technical audio. Great. And um, what programs do you use and what are the best ones to learn on? Like, how do you, how do you start learning? Or did you just dive in to a program? So oh, that's among audio people, that's a loaded question, but um, <laughs> sorry. I'll start with what I use. So mostly for linear sound design, I use Reaper. Um, it's probably the ugliest audio program you could possibly use but it is incredibly powerful in, in terms of like providing you customization of your workflow. And so that's super cool. Um, I work mostly in Unity, although I've been doing a little more in Unreal recently. And I use mostly FMOD, although I've been doing some more stuff in WISE for like the audio kind of integration process. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, FMOD and WISE are essentially replacement audio engines for whatever game engine you're working in. Um, and they also provide custom tool sets to allow you to implement your audio in kind of more manageable ways. So if you need sounds to play randomly, um, so like you need, I don't know, to select one of eight random footsteps to play, uh, they just allow you to create like an event that um, you can drop all eight of those sounds into and it'll just randomize it. And then you can do a ton more from there, but that's kind of the basic idea. Um, but going, going back to the question, what was the question again? Oh yeah, what tools would I recommend? Yeah. If you're just starting out, pick what you have access to. Um, Unity is great for the game dev side of things. Um, a lot of people like Godot, especially on like the, the indie side of things that's, that's been gaining a lot of popularity recently. And that's G O D O T. I, I assume mm -hmm. it's some Scandinavian country <laughs> is where that's from, but, <laughs> uh, so that, that's a good option. And then Unreal has a lot of kind of free tools and like a lot of resources to get started with now too. Um, but for the audio side of things, you can try both FMOD and WISE for free. Uh, you can publish for free with them up to a point. And there are other solutions. I mean, you can use the stock game engine solutions. And then there's their programs like Fabric, which is a smaller one, but I think they're spinning up some new tools right now. Um, and then for like the raw audio side of things, Honestly, for like half of what I do, something as simple as Audacity is great. Um, if you have the Adobe suite, you can use their, um, what is it? Uh, Audition, I believe. Um, most people learn on Pro Tools. Most people that I know of, at least, don't like Pro Tools. <laughs> um, but anything's great. I know a lot of people who use Logic. I know a lot of people who use Ableton. I know a few people who use uh, FL Studio. So just whatever kind of you have or you feel makes sense for you, it will work. Great. Uh, this leads to an, a really nice question pretty well from Jake, who asks, um, is there a good way using Unity to create sounds that respect hallways, walls, and other obstacles? <laughs> A good way. Um, custom tooling 
and there's there's unity doesn't have a great solution for this built in uh what i will say is the general way that you create kind of like atmospheric feel in games at least at a basic level unless you're getting like super complex is you just throw some geometry in the space like a rectangle or a couple rectangles and you assign that to a reverb plugin so in unity if you go into the the mixer groups you can assign a mixer um like a you can uh, assign it a reverb effect and then you can tune that to what you want the space to sound like and then keep the geometry simple so that it doesn't have to do much calculation. Um, just, just enough, just make it like cover your bases in terms of like where the player is. You could even just use trigger zones if you've got a really kind of like boxed in level design. Um, when you try and get more complex, oh, and then also create transitions between, uh, often you'll see this referred to as portals. Um, but it's essentially just a region where you'll fade between two different effects presets. So that's kind of the, the way that 99% of that is done. Um, there are some sort of crazy R and D or like kind of cutting edge, um, ways of doing it where you're analyzing geometry, but that's super expensive on the CPU side. And usually people don't have the, uh, audio budget for that. That's fair. And um, another good question that follows up with this is a lot of people might hear sound and think, oh, you just play an MP3. Can you talk a little about all the work that goes into game and which people and, and game sound, which people don't think about? Oh, a little. Yes, I can talk a little about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's kind of the 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 middle portion of that is the chunk of what I do and sort of where my specialization is. Um, on either end of me, there are, obviously there's like the engine programmer who's creating all the logic and like the gameplay programmer who's, you know, creating all the behaviors within whatever game engine or like within ever whatever uh, engine you're working in and whatever structure. But on the other end of the spectrum, you've got people going out and recording sounds and uh, mixing and mastering and applying effects to those sounds. And that's all just linear kind of editing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you could just take an MP3 of a footstep and drop it into, into a scene. But if you hear that same footstep play over and over and over in the exact same way, no matter what material, material you're standing on and which room you're in, and no matter like what shoe the character's wearing, that's going to get old pretty fast. Um, so I want wet footsteps throughout a whole game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's somebody's aesthetic, I'm sure. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, I mean, that is the idea. Uh, so this is where middleware comes in really handy. Tools like FMOD and WISE. Um, you can take your, I don't know, say eight footsteps of walking on wood floor. And you can, as I kind of mentioned earlier, randomize which one is going to be selected every time the character uh, takes a step. You could even break it down even further if the game's really detailed and have both the heel and the toe contact separate. Mm. Um, you'll see that once in a while, especially on larger budget titles. Um, so yeah, so you can take all those footsteps and jam them into a container to randomize which one's played. And then you can have a separate container for like a different material of floor. So maybe you've got wood into tile. And then depending on which one you're doing, you'll um, kind of trigger between the two. Um, and then maybe you've got wood in a small room versus like a really big cathedral hall. So you'll have, as I kind of touched on earlier, separate reverb presets for either of those. Um, You'll add, you can add even more kind of uh, variation in your random footsteps by adding just a little bit of random volume adjustment to each of them and a little bit of random like pitch adjustment. Not, not a ton, maybe like uh, one step in either direction and like one 1.5 decibels in either direction. 
just kind of like minor adjustments. Um, to make it all different in different environments? Well, both in different environments and just to like, so if you hear a sound in real life and then you hear the same sound in real life, it's never actually the same sound. Mm. And to kind of simulate that in games, more so simulate the feeling of that in games, just applying as many tiny adjustments to otherwise identical wave files or sound files um, kind of helps trick your brain into thinking you're not hearing the same sound over and over because you're really not. That's really interesting. And that's that like leads into kind of a good question that Jake asks. Um, but I'm going to further add that like I have actually been into an audio studio at a game gaming um, office. And there were so many different like tools and things that I didn't even expect could be used to record things like fishing poles or two mm -hmm. sticks or just random objects. And I'm wondering, and, and so is Jake, like how do you find creative and satisfying good sound effects for different events? And what are some online resources for sounds that are freely available? Mm. Um, if none are free, what are some other options? So, I think the best answer I can give, and this isn't my area of expertise. Um, I do some recording and some kind of, you know, bully work and all of that, but it's it's kind of on the smaller side of tasks that I take up for myself. Um, but I think a lot of a lot of what it comes down to is just kind of knowing or having an idea of like what the type of sound you're after is or what the piece of the type of sound you're after is and then um experimenting and seeing what other people have done and doing similar things to that or different things from that if you've heard about some uh like the the classic one of the classic ones that's always mentioned is stormtroopers when they're walking from star wars and that is really just somebody doing a bunch of Foley recording, holding a lot of like rollerblades and old like plastic helmets and stuff like that. Um, and how they got to that, I don't know. They probably saw the picture and kept trying things until it sounded right. Um, <laughs> there are some sounds that kind of make more intuitive sense than others. Like if you have a sword shing, you probably want to play around with things that are metal that have a lot of like tonality and openness to them, like knives and spatulas. Spatulas are great. <laughs> um, <laughs> but beyond, beyond that, it's, yeah, it's a lot of experimentation. It's a lot of like recognizing sort of the characteristic of the sound you're going for. If it's dry, if it's wet, if it's metallic, if it's hollow. Um, and trying to find objects that invoke that as closely as you can. Um, as for places to find free sounds, there are some websites. I think freesound.org is one. There are a couple others. Uh, one thing to be careful with there is what the licensing is on each of those sounds because they're not all free for like commercial use. Some of them are un under like Creative Commons Zero. Some of them aren't. Um, so looking a little bit into which licensing tags serve kind of the need of whatever project you're working on can help there. Um, otherwise for sound effects, um, there are a lot of places that sell libraries and they'll also give out like little chunk, chunks and samples of libraries if you sign up to their email, uh, website or their, um, mailing list and that's one way of getting your hands on like some pretty high quality recordings. Generally not a ton of them, but like if you can find ones that are useful to you that way. It's a super good way to get your foot in the door. Um, every once in a while, I think recently uh, the Humble Bundle has been putting up asset packs that include like a bunch of sound effects and music. And some of those have actually been surprisingly good quality for not that much money. Um, even like their $1 packs have had some stuff that I've actually used in uh, games in, well, in 
Yeah, in games. <laughs> Yeah, I've noticed there are a lot of resources out there. Um, I make videos for Code Day, so I have, I'm always looking, and mm -hmm. <laughs> we ended up purchasing a membership for a place, but um, there's definitely a lot of options out there if you, if you look for, like, it, it's, I would say it's hard, but it's not, you have to, like, make sure it's royalty free, that's the, that's the key. Yeah. Um, I have to ask, what is the most bizarre object that you've had to record to make a sound and what sound was that hmm. that's a good question i gotta know <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i win for this one like i haven't done a lot of like super bizarre recordings i have done some some stuff on the stranger side possibly but like mm. I've, I've never so the the team over at arena net uh, they have a video up where they're creating like this giant bellows and like throwing a bunch of jello down the neck of this tube they attach to the end of it to create breathing sounds for some monster i've never done anything that's like that out there oh my um, god i did cut up a bunch of bamboo and strap it together to perform fully with though um this was back when i was in school um we were doing, I think, a redesign of the For Honor release tra trailer or announcement trailer, and there's one. There's a character in that trailer that is partially covered in like wooden armor, and I really wanted to evoke that characteristic. Mm -hmm. So, I was sitting in a room, kind of jingling bamboo that was tied together with string around for <laughs> twenty minutes or something. Uh, so that was one of the. Maybe not the weirder ones, but like definitely the more kind of fun, memorable ones to me. Um, I think just because I spent a lot of time kind of pre-producing my prop. That's fair. I, I'm satisfied with that answer. Jiggling <laughs> around a bunch of bamboo sounds pretty interesting to me. Yeah. Um, so Thomas wants to know, how important are sound effects when designing a game? Depends who you ask. Um, but if you want to know, turn the sound off. <laughs> that is totally fair. <laughs> I personally play Animal Crossing on mute, and I don't feel like I've missed anything. <laughs> yeah. It depends on the game a lot, and it depends on the feeling the game is trying to evoke. Um, there are a lot of games that will I think sound sound effects fill kind of two, in my brain at least, two general buckets. Um, there are sounds that exist to evoke an emotional feeling. So to kind of like tell you what the intent of a certain action in the game is, if it's supposed to be scary and seem overwhelming, or if it's like lighthearted and kind of goofy. Um, and then there are sounds that exist, and there's overlap in this, but there are sounds that exist to convey some sort of a mechanical or um, essentially convey meaning to you. Um, and I think for those in particular, if you remove them, sometimes a game can be really hard to even play. <laughs> Yeah. Um, because they're they're your cue that something is happening in the, in, in the game. Sometimes they're your only cue. Usually they're not, but sometimes they're your only cue. That's fair. And yeah. when I'm walking around in a game and there's secrets that make sounds, I would want to know. I would want to hear them. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's one thing if um, if you're it's one thing if you remove the sounds that lack emotional feel and like the game feel like. The, the sounds that are serving kind of that emotional feel. Like if you remove those, the game might feel kind of dead or boring or bland comparatively. But yeah, if you're missing out on the actual information, that's sometimes problematic. Sometimes it's fine. Depends on the gamer. Um, so another good question. How does technology make game sound more immersive? And how has that changed over time or over the time that you've been 
you know, working with sound design. I think the biggest thing with immersion. So initially going back 10, 20 years, um, I guess going back about, so probably 95, 96, somewhere in there, uh, sound design started to kind of use like real MP3s and recordings. Um, so that's, that's when you're first touching on using real sounds for, or like real recorded sounds for um, sound design and not just synthesized material. Um, so that opens up the palette a lot to options for sound designers and artists and designers in general. But uh, their audio budgets were not very big, meaning they couldn't fit that many sounds and that many high quality sounds in the game. Um, and I think as the amount of memory a game is allowed, like technologically has increased, more options have become available for people to explore um, immersion as a whole, I guess. Immersion's a weird term. I'm gonna go on a little bit of a tangent here, but so <laughs> immersion, <laughs> to me immersion is like, how much do I feel like I'm in this world of the game? Like how, how in the moment am I when I'm playing? Um, whereas, I think what often gets referred to as immersion is actually realism, which is how closely does the game that I'm looking at, and this may not answer the question at all, but how closely does this game that I'm playing and engaging with mirror either reality or like the reality it's trying to convey? Um, and to that end, I think we're pretty close to like a good imitation, but really far from like actual mirroring of reality. Um, but as far as immersion goes, I think the biggest thing recently that has helped this is a lot of the 3D spatialization work that's done in VR or around VR. Um, when you mix for a 2D game, a lot of what you're doing is kind of baked down to sounds being played on a 2D plane, even if the game is in 3D. Um, it's not really that simple because like you still have positional sounds being played in front of you. But like when you add VR into the equation, you add um, kind of head motion. Now you're like able to tilt your head and turn your head sideways and then at an angle and there are some subconscious tricks that really help our convince our brains that we're hearing a real sound. When you start like delaying a sound in, in front of us um, slightly differently to each ear, depending on how you turn your head and like rolling off little bits of the detail from either ends. Um, oh. So I think that's kind of the biggest thing recently, but um, in terms of immersion, I think artistry plays a lot more into at least my definition of immersion than most of the technological um, leaps. The technology is doing really cool things in terms of like realism and in terms of allowing different kind of degrees of immersion though. I don't know if that makes any sense at all, but. Oh, it makes sense to me. Okay. And I don't know anything about <laughs> sound or audio or anything. Um, let's ask a fun question. Can you tell us about your favorite audio project and what you're most proud of? Mm. Hmm. My favorite audio project. I actually, that would have to be the game that I just finished up working on. Um, it's a little twin stick slasher entitled Breakpoint. Um, 
I think it's my favorite audio project, not because of the audio work necessarily as a whole. I just had a blast working with the team on that project. And it started as a game jam project, which was really cool. Um, and apparently that's not something that happens very often, just pe people taking game jam games to actual publication. But uh, yeah, I, I just had a blast working on that team and kind of like learning and problem solving surrounding like the unique situations that were involved in that project. Um, I experimented with some really weird, cool systems involving like dynamic time scaling of stuff. Um, there's a lot of like slowdown in that game from hit stun, hit pause, stuff like that. So learning how to like from problem solving around like what do you do when you're halfway through playing a sound and the whole game stops for a second? <laughs> do you stop playing the sound? Do you not stop playing the sound? Do you slow it down? So I did a lot of experimenting with that and that was super fun for me. Um, what was the other half of that question? Um, just what are, you, what are you most proud of mm. with that project? Okay. So yeah, it is probably that, but also just having like completed a thing, I think is always, it's a weird kind of, it, it, it hits you slowly, but that's, that's a, that's a really kind of unique feeling that is really enjoyable um, in kind of like a slow burn way. I can appreciate that. Um, are you able to show us or walk through something that you've made? I can um, allow you to screen share if you want. If not, totally no worries. Uh, it's, it's, let me think. Or you could show us that project that you worked on. Sure. Um, I don't know how much I can show for the act from the actual project itself, but I can, I'll throw this in here for you if you want to throw it up. This is this is the website for it. Um, and then I'll throw the other sort of visual effects project up. Um, students, I don't think are able to see our chat. Um, but I can try to see here. Mm -hmm. All right, it looks like all attendees will get these links, which is great. They can look at what you made. Thank you for yeah. some calls. Um, we have a few more questions to go over. Um, one of which is many people think that if you're a programmer on a game, you must be working on an engine, but in reality, there are a lot of different technical roles working together to ship a game. Can you tell me about some of the other coders you work with and what they do? Hmm. So I myself spend most of my time programming, uh, working on tools. And that's something that's outside of the sort of like direct game engine realm. Um, when I'm working in Unity, I'm still working within like the Unity editor and Unity engine, but I'm not working on code that will necessarily make it into the game itself. Mm -hmm. um, so oftentimes what that'll look like, sometimes it will, but oftentimes what that'll look like is I'm building tools to kind of allow people to augment and like drag and drop different audio options and settings and like different artistic tools. So like in the case of the visual effects engine, which the, the, the link for it, the Twitter link is for the final product, product in quotes, final piece is um, in the chat. But um, in that case, a lot of what I was doing was creating tools and systems to allow Steve, our artist, to kind of like put effects and transformations where he wanted them relative to what was going on in the music. So none of that really shows up in the actual P 
pace. It's all just kind of like it's it's just tool extra tools on the side of things. Um, so tools programmers are one type of thing, or one one kind of categorization of that, um, and probably the biggest one. But you'll also have people who will be working on. I guess this is still tools, but like externally from the engine tools for management tasks and particularly at larger studios, um, tools for like creating workflows and workflow improvements for like artists and even just other managers and management people um, externally. Another sort of place where I'll use them is I'll do a little bit of uh, Reaper allows you to do Python scripting as well as a couple other languages. Um, Reaper again being the sort of linear audio workstation that I use. Um, but it, it allows you to create custom tools just for Reaper itself and I, I use Python for that. So things like if I want some really specific like selection randomly between multiple clips and like I want a hotkey that does a very specific function like trim everything to this point exactly and apply these effects to it at the press of a button or like render a random selection of these three things. Um, I can use Reaper to program that. So those are some areas that come to mind. Great. Thanks for sharing. Um... What type of audio design is the most complicated? Hmm. Or at least most complicated for you. <laughs> <laughs> Music composition. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably music composition. I've done a lot of music and I still have no idea how to like, how people can write the music that they do. Um, <laughs> It, it blows my mind. Uh, and especially like within the timeframes that they do, like I, I've done some music composition and it usually takes me like eight to 12 hours to come up with a theme to even be in working on something. And wow, I've worked with people who've like come, they've like completed a song in like three hours. And that just, I have no idea. And I think there's a lot of variance in there as well. Like even for those people, like they complete the song in three hours because they have something that comes to their head and they've got they've got it all lined up. It's not always like that. Um, so it's like music for cut scenes or music for wandering around the world um, and that sort of music composition. Yeah, or like here's an action theme and here's here's a track that is used for like the menu of the game. And here's one that's used for, I don't know, a particular cutscene. Mm. But just like music composition in general, like, so to backpedal a little bit, I think most people would answer this question probably by saying something like creating some crazy reactive audio system or something. But that to me, I mean, for me, that is my wheelhouse. So. To me, that is maybe complicated, but not as complicated as like pulling magic out of a hat, which is how I see composition. <laughs> Just make up a song, like yeah. On the <laughs> um, an attendee question is: Do you have a favorite instrument? Mm. To play or to hear? I guess either or. To play, right now it's keyboard, um, but probably overall trombone. Nice. Um, but favorite instrument to listen to? I like a lot of experimental kind of out there stuff. So anything that kind of catches my ear with like really intricate, strange kind of handcrafted synthesizer patterns or anything weirdly like rhythmic is really enjoyable to me. But I also just like the cello. So, yeah. I like the cello too. <laughs> um, I think we are running out of questions. Um, 
have you made any full on songs for games or um like snippets of songs? Uh I've made snippets of songs and things for like my own projects, but nothing for anything that's been like published or even not nothing for anything that I've worked on with other people. Um, this is the last question from Jake, who asked a lot of questions. Thank you, Jake. Um, how can someone who isn't particularly musically inclined create an acceptable soundtrack for games? It's a really good question. Start experimenting and find the things you're drawn to. Um, find the things that come easiest to you, whatever that, whatever that is. If, if, if you're really trying to like create a thing for a game right now and you're, I don't know, you have not an unlimited amount of time, find what you're drawn to. Um, otherwise, do the exact opposite and do the thing that you feel like is hardest. Um, and I think that really holds true just for like probably audio as a whole, but I'm sure it branches beyond that. It's like, if you're under time pressure, you want to get something done, just do the thing that feels natural. And if you want to grow beyond that, do the thing that feels unnatural. Great, and we have um, another attendee question. Mm -hmm. um, how do you get great ideas for your games or interactive media that are successful? <laughs> Try things. <laughs> um, don't be afraid to make garbage and to fail because sometimes that stuff turns out to be the coolest stuff. Um, also, don't be afraid to do things that are simple. One of my favorite sounds in Breakpoint, the game that I posted earlier, is it's it's just a synth drop and breaking glass pitched a little bit. It's like super simple. It's really, really functionally impactful. And I came up with it in about 30 seconds during the jam, and it's in the final product. Like awesome. <laughs> some sometimes it's the simple stuff that, yeah, that ends up sticking and Sometimes you come up with nothing that you like and it's okay if you have time again to put that down and come back to it. Or just try something completely opposite from what you're thinking it should be. Just like with code, we cannot be afraid to fail. Yeah, absolutely. Um, since we are kind of out of questions, do you have any like final advice for students interested in game development or des or design or or audio or all of the above just like a nice little send off game jams are your best friend um or code days or code days <laughs> or hackathons all of these sort of like time pressured collaborative environments i think a lot of creativity comes up from those and a lot of unique learning and teamwork and problem solving that you really don't find anywhere else, um, at least not within kind of that much of a condensed time frame. Um, make the effort to connect with your local communities or online communities right now. Um, you'll find tons of cool people there and they're all going to be the people who you end up doing things with and for and um, yeah, don't be afraid to fail. I love that. All right. Um, well, with that, thank you so much for agreeing to, to um, join us today and, um, you know, volunteering your time to, to talk to our students. Um, audio is super interesting and something that I felt that students haven't really thought about before when making games. So, um, this was a really unique contribution to our series. So, Thank you again. Um, I really appreciate this. And I hope that we stay in touch and to potentially see you at Code Day. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank awesome. you. Thank you for having me. Thank it was, you so much. It was a blast. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, everybody. See y'all.